Hi everyone, this is Jacob with Sacred Earth Journeys, and we're back for another very special Journey Leader interview. This time, we got to sit down with best-selling author, mythologist, and veteran travel leader, Phil Cousineau, who leads many of our journeys through Europe, including our journeys to Greece and Italy in 2022. During this talk, Phil explains how cultural delicacies such as those from Italy can serve as a gateway into the sacred. Next, Phil and I dive deep into the importance of pilgrimage from both a personal growth and mythological perspective. Phil teaches that in order to make travel a pilgrimage rather than merely a vacation, we must slow down, breathe, and tap into the soul of a place. It can help, Phil explains, to stimulate the mind before travel by reading relevant books and participating in conversation, such as Phil's famous long conversations. Finally, Phil offers advice for pilgrims who wish to keep the spark of ecstasy alive after returning from a life-changing journey, such as the adventures he leads with Sacred Earth Journeys. Thank you for being here and enjoy this conversation with Phil. Greetings for anyone tuning in. We are very happy that Phil Cousineau is giving us some of his valuable time here. Um, and Phil, I kind of like to, to start these conversations by just asking, um, where are you right now? Whether that be uh, emotionally, physically, spiritually, just, just kind of let us know, where are you? That's a great lead question. I, I like that. I feel like we're simpatico already. Literally, I'm in the old Italian neighborhood of San Francisco called North Beach, sitting right on top of Telegraph Hill. So I've got a bird's eye view of the world, which is wonderful. I lived here 30 years after growing up in Detroit, traveling around the world for many, many years. Uh, uh, on the figurative level, <laughs> where I am is still feeling slightly incarcerated, like most of the world. I've been at home for the last year and a half plus. However, I did have my first breakaway last week um, going down to Ojai, which Krishnamurti in the Theosophist's old grounds down just south of Santa Barbara in California. And that was my first trip since February 2020 when I actually gave a workshop on creativity and pilgrimage at the same place, the Cretona Institute in Santa Barbara. So this was a very curious way to travel, being on the road for the first time in many years when I've been traveling several times a year since I was 16 years old. So to be cooped up <laughs> for this long is rather harrowing. But it did, it was a kind of eyewash as my grandmother used to say, uh, an event or an experience that allows you to wash your face, wash your eyes, and see the world clean again. Uh, it makes me grateful for all the journeys that I've had before, grateful for the ability to have the, the money and the health and the wherewithal to travel the world, to see it both as a tourist, but also coming close to our theme for the day as a pilgrim. So with, with that in mind, I want to give a, just the, the brief background on that because it all came back on this six and a half hour drive down to Ojai and then back again with some of my favorite tunes on the car radio, feeling free, which is one of the glories of travel and it's not given enough credit. We Often we feel imprisoned at home, we travel and we're free, free as a bird. I think that was uh, the Beatles' last recorded song, free as a bird. In terms of my, my book, which is about to come out again, The Art of Pilgrimage in a third edition, which is remarkable after 25 years. So it's an anniversary edition, almost 200,000 copies on sale around the world. And it's one of those hit or miss. You never know which book, which movie, which song, which play is going to hit. But something was happening in the, in the late 1990s when I had the, the notion, the first inspiration for the book, that was outside of me and whatever talent I might have as a writer. And that is in those late 1990s, travel was about to surpass the armaments industry and the computer industry, the car industry, the entertainment industry. 
as the number one business in the world. So being a good journalist, that's where I got my degree in, I began to poke around and ask why. And some of the answers were obvious, and you've probably come across this yourself, and that is travel may not seem like it when we cut the checks or offer our visa card up, but travel is cheaper now than any time in human history. It's also safer, even if you've lost a wallet or someone stole your passport somewhere along the line. Overall, travel is much cheaper than it was. It used, to, it used to be so dangerous to travel. The common tradition, the common ritual for someone embarking on a journey any more than a day from their home was to write out a last will and a testament. That was just being responsible. There was a 50-50 chance when you left home up until about the 19th century that you would never come home again. So you would have a last mass given or said for you by the village priest. You would sign a last will and testament. You would shake hands with all the lads and have a pint down at the tavern. <laughs> there was a chance you weren't coming back. So with all that in mind, travel is easier. But what fed this huge surge was a rebound, a resurgence of pilgrimage. And my first response was, Oh, oh, this doesn't sound good. Oh, not a return to a knee-jerk religion, which was, by the way, was Martin Luther's objection to pilgrimage and also Carl Jung's objection of all people in the 1920s, because both of them had this reservation that anything that just led to rote behavior, people doing things because everyone else was telling them to do it, is not a good formula for psychological health. <laughs> But what I was discovering then in the 90s, late 90s, when I wrote the book, and again, even recently, is that pilgrimage is an, is an ancient word. And what it means is actually walking through the fields per agram. That's the origin of the word pilgrimage. It has nothing to do with piety and, and very conservative religion. It has to do with walking and thinking, contemplating, taking a moment to think, who am I? Where am I going in this world? So I, I, I wrote this book in the spirit of giving, offering up a model in response to often what I think of as it, was it the, the Peggy Lee syndrome. She was a, a, what they used to call a torch singer, like an Amy Winehouse for the 1950s. <laughs> and she, she sang a song called, Is That All There Is, My Friends? And it was a real heart jerking or tear jerking song about disappointment, disappointment in love, disappointment in the world's affairs. And frankly, this is one of the travel, the travel industry's dirty secrets. People pay a lot of money. They spend a lot of time off and they get sick. They get ripped off and they're not home. If you are alert when you're traveling to Peru, to Chile, to South America, Paris, London, San Francisco, where I live. You see this all the time. So when I came across this model of pilgrimage, is there something there that could help the average traveler? I wrote this book called The Art of Pilgrimage that offers just a simple model. Pay attention and think about your intention. Why did you leave home in the first place? What are you looking for out there? Are you looking for love? Are you looking for spiritual answers? Are you looking for freedom to think about the next step in your life? And somehow when the book came out in 1998, it was, uh, you never know how this is going to happen, but it was the right book at the right time. It hit, it hit bestsellers lists all around the world. It was suddenly translated in, into a dozen languages. Why? It was, it was partly because I used, I was trying to answer this question, is it possible to get more out of our travel? out of our journeys, out of our quests. Uh, even recently, I've heard different references. I heard someone in one of our North Beach cafes saying, I'm going back home where I, I, I grew up in Michigan to go to a family funeral and I'm, and I'm going to take a pilgrimage to my parents' graves. And I thought, that's an example of reaching out for a word that has some deep, deep resonance. That's much older than you and me. And it doesn't have anything to do with piety, traditional religion. It has to do with a way to travel 
in, in search of some kind of meaning or purpose. And I think that that's what I was trying to offer with this book. Great. I, I love that you're coming out with a third edition of the book. Um, I mean, when you wrote the first edition and released it in 98, I was, I think, two years old. <laughs> and a month ago, when I was at my uh, local library in California, Huntington Beach, California, I was in the used book section. They sell used books there for just a couple cents. And I was in the mythology and religion section. And within the first minute, bam, I saw your book right there, The Art of Pilgrimage. And I thought, oh, gee, I better I better did that. I, I had listened to the audio book uh, before in the past while on a long journey through Mexico. Um, uh, but this time, just in preparation for this interview, is really rewarding to find it. And it felt like it just kind of came to me at that time, just was just there. And I did, had no, I did not expect that. Um, well, that's w one of the ways to consider, which used to, which is a beautiful word that used to mean uh, lying on your back and looking up at the stars, considerous. When do we do that? When we're at a life's crossroad, you want, what do I do next? What do I think next? Do I commit to a relationship or a job? So th that's the kind of book that people read. I'm so lucky that this happens again and again, sometimes every few years, and you find that you changed since the last time that you read it. This time around, what I did, I wrote what's called a, a preface to the third edition, in which I list a number of references to people who've written to me over the course of the years. And I'm blessed, not all writers get feedback, but I get letters virtually every day from somewhere in the world. And I don't mean just emails. I mean, slowly, soulfully handwritten letters. Um, so in this, <laughs> I, I list a letter that I got in an old fashioned, par fashioned Paravion blue letter by uh, written by three nuns on a tramp steamer traveling from Australia to Indonesia because they had read The Art of Pilgrimage and they apparently when you turn 50 as a nun, <laughs> you get to go somewhere for a few weeks or a month. So they decided not to go to a Christian place, but having read The Art of Pilgrimage, they wanted to go to Borobudur, which is one of the most glorious Buddhist Hindu sites in the world. So these three nuns, three different kinds of handwriting, all writing to me say, thank you for giving me an idea about Spreading, one of them said, spreading the, the wings of my compassion. It was a, a phrase like that. And that's part of the purpose of the book, to consider how other people have traveled throughout human history. I, I argue that it's a tradition that is probably 60,000 years old, if you consider the Australian Aborigine walkabout, which I consider a kind of pilgrimage, which means you are in a, a psychologically risky zone, so to speak, Maybe you've had your heart broken, or you lost everything in a fire, uh, terrible political shenanigans going on around you. These tend to be the circumstances when people consider going on uh, a kind of pilgrimage, which, see what I just did? I took a breath there. That's what a, a pilgrimage is compared to a tourist trip, when you are trying to stuff in, pack in as many sites, as many encounters with people as you can in a day. And by the end of a week or so, you're wondering, what happened? <laughs> Who did I see? Right. Does it mean anything? <laughs> right. So there is a way to slow down, to pace ourselves, which is the, the purpose of the book. Uh, another interesting story that I tell in the new preface to the new book, which is applicable here, because of the way that it, it brings the whole art of memory into the notion of travel. You know the word souvenir, it's, it's French for memory. If you take home a, a, some water from Lourdes, some soil from the Garden of Gethsemane, if you bring home a souvenir baseball bat from the Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame, you're bringing home souvenirs. Why? Because something has happened that you want to, not even want to, you long to remember. And it's one of the pains of travel when you think, what did happen? What did we see? It's the old joke. Was that Belgium on Tuesday or, or was that Germany and France or Luxembourg on that day? So the 
five years ago when, or a number of years ago when the second edition of The Art of Pilgrimage came up, I had a book signing at one of our country's best bookstores, Book Passage, outside of San Francisco. And I noticed in the front row, there was an older woman holding what appeared to be a scrapbook, a very elaborate jeweled, bejeweled scrapbook. And it seemed like she had a couple of grandchildren next to her and then probably her son and his wife. I'm looking at them and trying to stay focused on the book signing. Afterwards, after I signed all the books, they came forward and the older woman said, I, in very halting English, I didn't know that reading could also be a pilgrimage. And she offered her scrapbook to me. And that's when the son stepped forward and said that her, his mother had had a stroke. She had lost the ability to speak. They couldn't do anything for her. And finally, the speech therapist said or asked, ma'am, what's your favorite book? And she just wrote down, I think it was, she, because she couldn't speak, she wrote down The Art of Pilgrimage. And the speech therapist had the wherewithal to say, I want you to go into your copy of the book and then take scissors and cut out all of your favorite passages and then get some glue, buy a scrapbook and paste your favorite passages from the book into the scrapbook and then begin to try to enunciate and to pronounce your favorite words. And it worked. She created an entire scrapbook that was her version, you might say, of the art of pilgrimage. And the speech therapist must have thought something about the, the magic of memory, mm. uh, emotion. The combination of memory and emotion can bring your, maybe your hearing at one point, but in this case, it was the speech. And I've thought about that for the five years since this incident. And it occurs to me, that's what travelers are longing for. We want to remember more. And that's probably some of the motivation behind this. You see something beautiful when you're traveling and out comes the camera. These days it's the iPhone. Snap, snap, snap. And most tourists just keep walking. And then they wonder why they can't remember anything. Or what's the figure? If you look at a photo when you get home, it's two or three seconds. That's all you generally look at. It. Mm -hmm. So in the Art of Pilgrimage, or my way of leading a tour, I'm considering memory something sacred. This is what we're building memory when we travel, right? I hope we are. Yeah. But then how do we remember what becomes so emotional when we're traveling? Journaling and conversation. We talk to other people that we're traveling with. What did that mean to you? Uh, Notre Dame, the burned out ceiling of Notre Dame. What does that mean to you? So that, that's how, in a sense, that's the birth of my uh, almost patented now long conversations, which I have in all my tours. Right. Yeah, and one thing I really appreciate that's coming to mind about the art of pilgrimage is you bring up this idea that um, there can be many ways of pilgrimaging, if you would, or um, yeah, just, just simple pilgrimages are possible, whether that's just to a local park, if that's what you have access to in the moment. Um, and it's just about the preparation, the state of mind, what you're seeking, the intention, as you say. Um, and it reminds me of how I've had more profound moments in my local park because of my state of mind and intention than I've had perhaps abroad in some instances when Maybe I was worried about something and I was kind of just lollygagging around with the camera and not very grounded. Um, so that's one thing I appreciate about your book is, is just this concept of pilgrimage isn't necessarily about where we go. It's just about finding meaning in the present of whatever adventure we're currently on. Oh, thank you. That's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful point. It comes up not only when I'm traveling as a tour guide, but also as a filmmaker. Remember, I travel all around the world and I write books about my travels, but I also I make documentary films. Uh, I sometimes travel for television. And all this, it has to do with being present in that moment and finding a way to record, which is a beautiful old French word, by the way, for moving something through your heart. Recorder. You're quite the linguist. 
That's well, I've written books on word origins as well. Yeah. And it's one of the ways to pay attention when you're traveling. What words are we actually using to describe what happens to us? What words are the people that we meet and encounter? What, what language do they use? Can we understand it? So paying attention here's, it requires practice. It sounds very good in theory, almost romantic, but it, it takes daily practice. Here's one example. On virtually all the trips, if I'm with a film crew or if I'm leading a tour for Sacred Earth Journeys out of Vancouver, please check your websites. <laughs> it's that often we will encounter something glorious. Let's say the time when I took my group in Crete to one of the ancient goddess caves, not the, the typical Zeus cave where Zeus report supposedly was born, but a cave that has been dated to the Minoan era, 4000 BC or so. And in this one case, we went nine different floors down into, in a sense, in, into the underworld. Well, yeah. And we found an ancient a, a goddess shrine, a shrine to the, the goddess of childbirth. This was deeply moving. It was so beautiful. And our, our Cretan guide turned on his flashlight and we noticed there was all kinds of broken shards of pottery around us. And he would pick one up after the other. Oh, this is Minoan. This is the Roman era. This is the Christian era. Just like you and I might toss baseball cards around. <laughs> but at the same time, it was so mysterious. Most, most of us were stricken silent. Now here comes the, the trick and the... Uh, the goad, if you will. I need to goad people into being present. Isn't that something? It happens with virtually every tour, but also with my film crews. Let's be here now. So in this case, we've all had this life-changing encounter being down into Hades' underworld. And I begin to ask a couple people at the cafe before we get on the bus. And so how is that for you? And a couple of them were, I've never felt darkness as a physical entity so much good that's a great answer right that's a beautiful answer and a woman said she had four or five children she had no idea there was actually a goddess of childbirth wonderful answer wonderful and then one two three people said well this reminds me of the caves in nevada oh no this well i've been to those but this one what it reminded me of were the famous caves in bali and this is when an entire experience can get derailed that kind of association when you begin to compare and contrast with other places isn't so much an intellectual exercise as social signaling. You're signaling to others how well-traveled you are. And it's my goal. I desperately try this with each tour and I'm doing it out of love. I'm doing it out of love of travel, the, the respect for the place that we've been and the hope that I am, my team is helping provide you with something that sometimes is life-changing. To do that, you have to stay in the moment for as long as possible. And sometimes it means pushing away all of those chains of association. If you're well-traveled, of course they're going to be there. But the question is, do you really have to say it? Do you have to bring it up with the group? Because when you do, suddenly 20 other people have associations and we're not, in, in a figurative sense, we're not in Crete anymore. We're not in the moment. And then the, the emotional impact, the mythic resonance of the place starts to dissipate like the morning dew. If you can stay there, and what I, what I try to do, and I know it makes my tours different than others, if I can get us to a, a roadside taverna there, or a, a pub in Ireland, a, a cafe in Paris, as soon as possible to have a group conversation, then you can hold the energy into that circle. And it really should be a circle. And it takes some intense focus, but it's say, so, so Jacob, what happened to you when we were nine floors underground in this 4,500 year old cave? Anything happened? And if I ask you, with, and I'm gazing at you, and you really feel that I care about it, for you to be honest at that moment will encourage one other person, and then another, then another. 
and then you have a collective experience. Beautiful. And as we're kind of on this uh, topic of Hades and the underworld um, and kind of just the whole mythology surrounding like the archetypal underworld experience and such, I feel like it's a good time I have in my notes here. Um, this question for you on mythology, I feel other than um, a traveler and a writer and an author, people, a lot of people consider you to be an avid um you know, mythologer, and you've studied under Joseph Campbell. Um, so I feel like you can really speak to this question, um, which is, you know, many, many view mythology simply as kind of religious and imaginative symbols, something that's not real. You know, a lot of people are associating the word, oh, it's just myth to, oh, it's just not real. But um, what more can these symbols, these, these mythological symbols and archetypes provide to the everyday human? Um, you know, you're just speaking about people having this experience in the underworld and the underworld is something we kind of learn about in, in mythology. And so, so I feel like you can really speak to this. Well, thank you for bringing up that connection. Um, f first of all, yes, I worked with Joe Campbell for eight years and co-wrote the documentary about his life yeah. and then created the companion book, which was my first book. It helped launch my entire career. And it, the way that it overlaps with my work as a tour guide, but also as an author, is that mythology is concerned with how things come to be. Every culture has myth including current mythology. I live out in California. The mythology of Apple computers <laughs> is as powerful here as the mythology of Hades in ancient Athens. <laughs> and it's because humans everywhere want to know how things began. Where, who, who wore the first sweatshirt? Well, probably one of those hikers that we have found 5,000 years later in the Swiss Alps. They, we, we have found them wearing almost the exact same thing that you're wearing today. But also the mythology of baseball. When, when did baseball begin? When was the first book ever published? When was the first uh, storytelling session? Where do babies come from? What are the origins of the constellations? This is universal. And if you think of myth as the personification of energies, so, F, so everybody has felt the attraction of beauty. Everybody has felt lust in their life. Everybody has felt desire. That's great. And it's a way to find something common, but it doesn't have a face yet. So mythology puts a face on those things. And that face is named Aphrodite or Venus in the, in the Roman tradition. All those gods and goddesses are personifications of tremendous powers that are still working in us. We have elaborate mythologies. Let's say the American myth of progress. Most Americans think that that's universal. It's not. <laughs> if you travel the world, you, you realize that people have very squeamish associations with this huge surge in emphasis on progress. So in terms of travel, what I'm always trying to do when I take a group, let's say next spring to Florence, Rome, Assisi, Venice, Later on in the following tour, we're going to Greece. We'll go to Athens, uh, Sparta, Olympia. What I'm trying to do is get beneath the surface, the Chamber of Commerce surface uh, attraction. And this is universal. Every country does it. They want to bring you in with, a, with an iconic image of the romantic uh, beret-wearing beret uh, Frenchman who is alluring you to Paris and as he leans next to the Eiffel Tower. You can see all of this is symbolic language, but in my tours, I'm trying to get beneath that to find what I did in one series for PBS called uh, The Soul of the City. If you want to find something that is below the surface of the place, something that tourists are uh, generally mocked for, for being superficial, the music, the food, the mythology. There is a myth underneath virtually every culture, and it has lasted for a reason, because it personifies the entire culture. Uh, a couple of years ago, I led a tour through Helen and uh, Sacred Earth Journeys to King Arthur's England in search of the Holy Grail. 
Well, that happened 1,500 years ago, but look, Monty Python completely revived it. So Monty Python and the Holy Grail has shown how we are still on the search for the Holy Grail. It's a story that personifies Western Europe for a thousand years. The search for uh, spiritual purification, the search for rejuvenation, which is part of the symbolism of that chalice. So this is one of the tricks. If you really want to know a culture, if you're going to Colombia and South America, if you're going to Argentina, if you're going to uh, Bhutan, if you don't study some of the folklore, the legends, the fairy tale, mostly the myth, if you don't study that, you've only learned half the culture. Because what it reflects is, is subterranean. But it, all these stories influence the behavior that you will see around you in the course of the day. And this does not have to be, as uh, I think it was John Dryden used to say, dry as dust. You can make this entertaining. You can make it fun. A lot of these stories are very bawdy and naughty. So there's a way to liven them up. That's the purpose of it. Uh, in, in a nutshell, then, what, what, what we tried to do in our tours for Sacred Earth Journeys is you've got a circle representing, let's say, a journey, which was Joe Campbell's old model of the hero's journey. And on the top of it, you're trying to show the, uh, the everyday, the ordinary world. You have to deal with customs. You have to get on a bus. You have to schedule all your, your meals and so on. And then you'll see what everybody else sees on the surface of that circle. What, what everybody else sees. What I'm interested in is what's underneath. What? So in the case of uh, Italy coming up. I chose the title uh, La Dolce Vita, which sounds like it's a thousand years old, but it really only comes from a Fellini film in the 1960s, right? And it refers to the sweet life, but it's become a metaphor. And that's part of what we're trying to do. Uh, a metaphorical way of talking about these cultures, a metaphorical way of talking about how Jacob himself travels. And that is at some point in the, I believe it was in the uh, mid 1980s, Italy began to become very self-conscious of the, uh, sometimes it's called the, the prostituted tourist dollar. When you give up everything, you, you surrender everything, your freedom, and now your apartments through, a, through Airbnb, right? <laughs> For the tourist dollar. So now they're reconsidering all this, limiting the number of ships that can come into ports. But the upside of this is something quite, I think, quite poetic, quite beautiful. It's come out of it called slow life. Again, you take a breath. You don't rush and have a 20-minute meal. You schedule a three-hour lunch or a three-hour dinner in which you can do what? Have a conversation. <laughs> so it's wonderful, I think, that underneath the slow food La Dolce Vita movement is this emphasis that says, let's slow down, let's travel more slowly, let's see one thing vividly every day rather than five very superficially. And at the beginning, in my tours anyway, in the beginning and the end of every day, I have what's called the long conversation. And this is something that came out of my many years of knowing the great mythologist, Joe Campbell. And it was just a chance for Mark. He was coming to San Francisco and I said, hey, Joe, let's, let's have a scotch down the road at the hotel and let's carry on with our long conversation. And then as soon as I said it, I realized I had stumbled across a great metaphor because Campbell was one of those guys which he tolerated no small talk. No, how's the weather? How's the kids? How's the dog? It was amazing. What are you reading? What are you writing now? Where have you been recently in the world? You drop right down into what? Meaningful conversation. I heard your dad died. Let's talk about that. I hear you're going to divorce your wife. I hear you're going to take a new trip. You see, you know, my voice just naturally dropped when I was only half jokingly dropping those questions in. That's what it was like for eight years with Campbell. We would have two or three hours of electrifying conversation about things that matter. And that's what I try to do with my groups. I begin in the morning. Today, we're going to see uh, Dante's tomb. Or today, we're going to uh, walk in the footsteps of Verdi in Venice. Well, let's talk a bit about that. Who likes classical music? Has anybody here read Dante? 
Has anybody read the Aeneid, Virgil's Aeneid? I slowly edge people into the day. And then I back off and I let them talk. I have come to realize after 20 some years of doing this, after maybe 30 years of leading tours, Jacob, people are longing for this. Nobody asks them. So what did you read before you went to Scotland? Or afterwards, at the, at the end of the day, when we meet after a meal. So what did that mean to you to walk in the footsteps of our Nikos Kazantzakis today and learn how he wrote Zorba the Greek when he was living in, in the islands just outside of Crete? And then I open it up and I allow people to say something maybe for years no one has ever asked them. Mm. Just uh, what's your philosophy of love? Because, you know, that's why Dante is significant. He helped introduce an entire new philosophy of how people love each other. Now, you don't get asked that very often in most tours, but I've come to believe that's what people are longing to talk about. Yeah, I love this point about the long conversation because I feel like conversation is so important because sometimes it can bring out it can bring things out of us that we haven't even thought about for so long or things that we've kept hidden, but deep down have been just really, really, really just dying to share. And then once we begin sharing in this way, it almost brings out like this type of ecstasy in us. Um, and I think that really speaks to, you know, especially during these times, just our in it desire as human beings to connect and be seen and be heard. And particularly on, um, you know, a sacred journey, such as the ones led by you and Sacred Earth Journeys, this is like a really powerful tool, this, this long conversation that, that you're now, you know, patenting <laughs> to, to kind of just, you know, bring out this, this mindful state that we've been discussing um, in the pilgrim. You just uh, jarred me. Excuse me, in a, good way, in a good way there, when you brought in the pandemic, I think that that's part of the, the almost desperate loneliness that a lot of people have had to endure beyond the social is isolation, uh, beyond having to quarantine. All that is important. And my heart goes out to anybody who lost somebody during this pandemic. But on top of that, it's the loss of conversation. And having a Zoom meeting can help a little bit. Having a phone conversation can meet a little bit. To see my mother when uh, she recently passed away, but when she, at the beginning of the pandemic, she was in a rest home up in Sonoma, north of San Francisco. And all we could do was go up to a window and we would put our hands, all of our, the visitors would put our hands on the window and then look inside and see our mother, father, and uncle, grandparent, and it was poignant, but it, it also felt uh, symbolic of something that is happening in culture when, with the rise of social media and how uh, texting has replaced an actual human voice. Sometimes it's wonderful, it's often magical in Arthur C. Clarke's sense of how magic and technology are actually inseparable, <laughs> was a great point by the author of 2001, right? But in, in this sense, the, all, I, I think what's gonna happen when the tours come back and Godspeed to all those who are making these decisions, <laughs> let's hope we can travel next spring. When it happens, I, I believe that our long conversations are going to be even more important because for me, I'll, I'll, I'll ask, did, did any of you read a book during the pandemic that changed your life. And I'm not trying to be a smart aleck about this or intellectual. We had more time to read than probably any time in our lifetime. And many of us, I read a lot of classics that I had not, not avoided, but just didn't have the time to get to. So I will ask you, did you see any movies that meant a lot? Because I have movies on my, my movies and books on all of my lists for travel as a way of, of building up the background for what we are about to see. And then we'll talk about it. And we do a little bit of journaling as well. But the, the, the beauty of traveling this way is to learn 
practices that in some ideal way we should be doing anyway at home every day in our lives, but most of us don't do. We don't pay attention, especially walking down the city street in New York or London. Most people are bending over to, to look at their iPhones. They're not looking at the beauty of the 1920s architecture. They're not thinking, oh, uh, Jack London had a pint here, or that's where Dylan Thomas had his last 19 whiskeys, which is why he died in a New York <laughs> hospital, because he broke the record for whiskeys in this bar, the White Horse Tavern. So there are fascinating things everywhere <clears throat> if we lift our heads and learn to pay attention. And that brings up one of the more important points that for me in the book, which came about at the last, in the last minute, as, uh, as I was writing the last chapter of the book, and that has actually become one of the major components of the way that I lead these tours. There's a kind of panic that sets in in the last day or two. Ironically, if the tour is working beautifully and people start to weep, and I'm talking men and women alike, alike because things are happening. New friendships, I've had lifelong friendships have come out of these tours slash pilgrimages. Uh, slash study groups, and that is people want a way to keep the trips alive when they go home. And there is no book out there in the world that's going to tell you how to do that. So I tried to take it on by saying, that it, you can have some of the same foods, maybe a Greek food at home, uh, play some Greek music. There are some ways to keep some of the two alive, but it uh, happened, sure chance, serendipity is at work like you proposed a few minutes ago. There was a lecture here in San Francisco by the great uh, Vietnamese Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. And at the end, there was an audience question to the extent uh, you write a lot about pilgrimage, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, why is it important? And he surprised all of us. And by the way, art is always in the surprise. It's not in the expected. <laughs> and in this case, he said, and I can't do his accent in a, in a decent respect, but it was to the extent the true purpose of pilgrimage isn't just the encounter with glorious sites like uh, Santiago de Compostela or... Uh, the Field of Dreams baseball site in Iowa for a secular pilgrimage. He said the true purpose of pilgrimage is to return home and recognize your own backyard as sacred ground. And I think there's a whole PhD in what he is saying there. If you are traveling well with intention and respect and even reverence sometimes, reverence for people whose uh, priorities and customs are very different than yours, if you can do that, you will be learning. You will be changing. A part of you will be changing along the way. And then you come home, and the beauty of it is to reach for the, your, the doorknob on your front door and look at it. It's different because you're different. You unpack, and then you walk into your backyard, and you suddenly see this is special. I shouldn't have had to go halfway around the world to recognize this, but now I do. It's, it's really a beautiful thought, and it can be extended while you're home. Uh, my friends Lauren Artris and Alan Jones from Grace Cathedral here, they have been the, the main impetus behind the Labyrinth Revival. And according to my friend Laura, the last number was 6,500 labyrinths have been created around the world for meditation purposes. That's remarkable. And we're talking in, in parks, but also in prisons, in uh, rest homes, in children's hospitals, because the labyrinth <coughs> is a kind of physical model of an ancient pilgrimage. And they were originally intended in the 1000s and the 1100s for people who were infirm, who didn't have the money or the time to walk all the way to Rome or Jerusalem, Mecca or Medina. So if you're home and you want to keep your, your tour, your pilgrimage alive, you can play music, eat food from there, 
but also do some kinds of journaling to bring back the memories. Hopefully you've taken some notes along the way. <laughs> and then form some kind of uh, society. There are, what would you call them? Organizations, I suppose, for people who have completed the walk to Santiago de Compostela. And they're all around the world. So if you're feeling lonely and your, your best girlfriend, your best boyfriend, your parents do not want to hear about your walk to Santiago, <laughs> This is a phenomenon every traveler finds out. What, you don't want to hear about my tour to Paris? <laughs> Most of them don't after five minutes, right? There are groups. There are groups online for every imaginable famous site, even online whiskey tours to the, 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 the Scotch distilleries in, in, in Scotland. And why are all these popping up now? Human loneliness. People are getting lonelier and lonelier, partly due to there's some social forces there, but it's, it's also due to uh, social media. More connected, but less intimate than ever before. Yeah, and I also, well, I just want to take a step back to um, this idea of kind of integration. And you mentioned um, earlier, a bit earlier in what you're saying, um, how Thich Nhat Han mentioned that the lesson is that you come home and you realize everything I've needed was already here at home. Um, and, you know, whether it be telling stories when we get home as a form of integration, or as you're saying, many of your pilgrim pilgrims um, end up in tears by the end of their journeys because they want to know how to keep it going. How do I keep this feeling going throughout my life? How do I keep this, um, you know, this touch of like ecstatic wandering, like in my life? Um, and I feel like that brings us back to this, to this type of mindfulness and travel that we can take home and realize that the adventure has always just been in our day-to-day -day life, whether that be reaching for the doorknob or you know, navigating the labyrinths of life, whether that be a tough job and, and trying to see it in a new light. Well, that's a great observation. And for, well, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd like to lead off with the notion that every, as far as I know, every great religion, but also every great philosophical movement begins with a central metaphor that human beings fall asleep. Mm. That's human nature. So I don't like beginning with a sense of perfection that we should all aim for being constantly sentient and enlightened and aware and alert. That's not human nature. We become alert, it, it kind of sine waves like this. And then we fall asleep for a million reasons, chemistry, social movements, uh, plagues like we're under right now. And then it's the, the function of philosophy as, as Plato would have said, to awaken us to wonder. It's the function of art to alert us to the realization that we have the capacity to sing, dance, draw, write. And these are ways to preserve these journeys that we're talking about, Jacob. When you come home, don't be passive, be active. Write out what happened to you in a journal or drawings, uh, sometimes with uh, on online publishing now, you can create small books, <coughs> small books of your journeys. Yeah. Uh, dance companies. I, I led a, a peace pilgrim tour with the great anti-war Jesuit monk, uh, Father John Deere. And it was in honor of Thomas Merton and uh, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, a number of years ago, beginning from Merton's Abbey in Gethsemane, Kentucky, all the way into Louisville. And along the way, a, a, a Kentucky woman measured all of our feet. There were maybe a, a hundred of us on this walk, talking about the, the, the uh, connection between pilgrimage and peace. And this, it's an ancient one, by the way. So we all, I, we had no idea what she was doing, but we allowed her to trace the shape of our feet. And in the end, she came home and she made a quilt of our feet. It would have been probably 200 feet with our names sewn underneath it. And it was absolutely glorious. And now it's hanging, I think, in the Muhammad Ali 
Museum in Louisville, Kentucky, which is what he wanted because he said to us, he wanted to meet us, but he couldn't leave Michigan at the time. And he said, I was a man of war. I was a boxer, but now I'm a man of peace. So I hope you can end your pilgrimage at the Muhammad Ali Peace Museum. And then eventually he, <clears throat> he wanted the quilt, the peace quilt hung there. This is a way of keeping your journeys alive. See what I'm saying? It's a kind of tra a transformation of the physical experience into something manifest. A book of poems, a book of photographs. It's a way to preserve. And as you are doing it, as you're physically writing, shooting, designing, quilting in, in this woman's case, you are, I like to think of it as creating the Velcro effect of travel. Can you find a way to make it stick, which is the, the miracle of the invention of Velcro, right? Well, this is a function of art for so many years. Uh, not everybody is haunted with the disappearance of memory or feeling or emotion, but artists tend to be for reasons reason does not know. So we, we write, we encourage others. I have groups from different tours, from Ireland, Paris, Turkey, Greece, who continue to meet because what happened was so important that they've needed to make a, a conscientious effort to keep the thing alive. Yes, and I feel equally as important to what happens after pilgrimage Perhaps we should discuss a bit about what happens before pilgrimage. And um, I feel that it's, it could be a general dissatisfaction with life that can call many to adventure. And so I think this begs the question, when on pilgrimage, how do people find what they, what they need? And how does it, you know, I guess, I guess we've kind of already answered that. So I want to, I want, I want to talk more about well, what's going on in people's minds and in their hearts before the pilgrimage, before they decide to make this journey? Most people who would sign up for a, a journey, a type of travel like this, would know my work, either through Campbell and all the work with the hero's journey, which, by the way, is lurking underneath what I call the pilgrim's journey here, but also my work with creativity in which I have a book, Stoking the Creative Fires, and the model is very similar to, uh, from inspiration to actual creation. What is in common between all of them? Restlessness. So I try to make it up front. If you just need a break, you don't need to take my pilgrimage. If you just want a vacation, God bless you. Yeah, go off to the beach and read James Missioner for five days or seven days. <laughs> people do, people are exhausted in most modern situations all around the world, not just the States. So a vacation, even in the language, it means to vacate your mind for a week or two. It's not supposed to be too serious. The idea is you just need to rejuvenate. But if you are restless, if you've traveled in ways that have been very unsatisfactory, let's say an overpriced cruise tour or a place where after two days on the beach in Acapulco, you were bored to tears, but you were stuck <laughs> for two weeks down there. I get some of those people on my tours. This is part of the entire premise of this uh, in all the major religions, but also in, in terms of secular pilgrimage, let's say literary pilgrimage, walking to the tomb of Virgil in Rome, or walking or taking a trip to Einstein's patent office in Switzerland, which a lot of people do. A hundred years, it's now 115 years later. They will go. They may not use the word pilgrimage, but that's what it is. If you were walking in the footsteps of someone you deeply admire, and you're not quite sure you want to go, but you want to touch that wall. <laughs> I, I've been to uh, Shakespeare's house in uh, Stratford on Avon, and most people have read very little Shakespeare since college, but they want to be in the house. This is the Shakespeare pilgrimage, uh, uh, the motto, which is maybe something will rub off on me. <laughs> it could be Emily Dickinson's brilliant genius. <clears throat> it could be Einstein's genius. That's the model, that we are restless. We're, time is slightly out of joint, to quote the bard again. 
Uh, and one of the metaphors I often use is that we're a little bit out of touch with ourselves, with our dream of who we want it to be, maybe with, out of touch with our friends, with our spouses. And so one of the central metaphors I found everywhere in every pilgrimage site, sacred or secular that I've ever been to, is that a practice is offered of reaching out and touching. So I travel to Konya in Turkey, which is famous for what? Rumi, the most famous poet in the world, 900 years after he died. He's on the bestsellers lists, right? And I've been there several times, soldiers, farmers, peasants, college professors, every imaginable kind of visitor goes to Rumi's tomb in Konya, Turkey. And then what do they do? They reach out and with their fingertips, they touch the side of the casket. And I am deeply touched by that urge. It's not necessarily religious, it's human. We want to touch something that we respect, we rever. Uh, it's maybe an old kind of folk remedy, call it superstitious if you want, but it's irrepressible. I've been in the, the basement of the Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame. And uh, the Cooperstown librarian said, so what, he didn't say, what do you want to see? He said, what do you want to touch? Isn't that something? Beautiful. And I'm looking all around me and here are all, I, I'm a bit of a big baseball fan since I was a kid, but this was, this was home run territory for me. Right. I could touch anything. And I, I was immediately picking up on the, the pilgrimage metaphors here. So I said, Babe Ruth's bet. And it was in a drawer. He very dramatically opened up the drawer and with white gloves, he put white gloves on me, handed me the bat. And I felt similar to the way I did when I was at the Assisi Cathedral of St. Francis of Assisi. And they offered me a chance, this was just five or six years ago, to touch the femur bone of St. Francis. Wow. You see, and that's why we call these relics. Yeah. Throughout Europe, Throughout human history, we've had relics. We have our own today. So people say myth is dead <laughs> and it died 4,500 4, years ago, whatever it was. We still feel that, uh, that urge, probably for the sacred, something that is sacred to us individually or sacred to us as a group. I build this into my itineraries when I'm working with Helen to take a, from Sacred Earth Journeys to take a group somewhere, I'm highly conscious. I'll be careful about the language because I don't want to have anybody recoil because of too much religious language. But the notion is, is, the, the, is the same. If we're going to visit, let's say, the, the oldest bakery in Paris, for me, that's sacred because I know the role of bread in Paris. <laughs> And they might or might not use the word, but your local loaf of bread or your daily loaf of bread is a sacred ritual. It, the price is actually regulated by the government. It is that important to the French people. And I happen to know the, the, the famous baker, Lionel uh, Poilan. And I took my group years ago to, to see him. And this for me was a sacred encounter because, and this is what I try to do with all the tours, Come, kind of coming full circle. You see something so-called important on, on the itinerary, but we need then to convey why it's sacred and why it might move you, not change you, certainly not just impress you. That's all Chamber of Commerce material, all the impressive business. Yeah. I want to know how to move people. Yeah. So if I take my group, I think it was three floors below into the catacombs of Paris, three floors below the Rue de Cherche Midi in Paris, where the original bakery was. And Monsieur Poulon, who's a very dapper man with a, with a, a black uh, bow tie and old baker apron, <laughs> he was a, very charming. And he begins, uh, it just took one question, but I rehearsed these questions for a long time because I want my group to get it, my, the groups to get it. I said, uh, Monsieur Poulain, I remember there was a wonderful French poet in the 19th century who said that the bakery 
The bakery is the soul of the village. What do you think of that? And I'll never forget his response. He's, <laughs> he did one of these classic Maurice Chevalier moves. And he said, voila, c'est ça, that's it, that's it. For, bread isn't just uh, stuff to eat. Bread is philosophy. And then because I asked him the right question in the right moment, and I was respectful about it, he spoke for a half an hour about the role of bread in French history. That I think makes our tours a little bit different where you try to get a sense of not just, isn't it cute? Isn't it funny? Isn't it charming that a little kid has a long baguette on his shoulder? Well, that's all fine, but why? Why is it charming? Why are you moved right now? <laughs> anyway, that, that keeps me interested. So no matter where Helen and I want to take groups anywhere in the world, we want to move below the surface, and tell the stories, yes. uh, and in, enjoy the, the soul of the culture, however we can. I think that's such an important story to bring out the importance of why something like La Dolce Vita can be considered sacred and worthy of pilgrimage. Just that story and those touches you add about asking, you know, the baker that type of question and bringing out so much, perhaps even a long conversation out of him because of that, that nice touch you add. And I also love this idea of, you know, when it comes to pilgrimage, and I know on the pilgrimage to Italy, we, you know, do visit sacred places like, uh, you know, the temple at OCC and, but also a pilgrimage could be going to touch the baseball bat of Babe Ruth. It could be, I, I feel that we, we really long to be in touch with an important almost time period where things were happening. And it, it kind of reminds me of when I was a university student uh, at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo um, at the public library, they brought in the original scroll of Jack Kerouac's On the Road. And my, po my poetry friends at the time and myself, we took a pilgrimage, we walked on foot to the library and it was there in a case and we wanted to touch it, but yep, yep, yep. you know? That's what I call the pilgrim mood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to get up close to it. Maybe it'll rub off on me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I know that scroll well. I'm just five minutes from the Beat Museum here in San Francisco. Is that yeah. where they usually have it? Uh, it moves around from scholarly site to scholarly yeah. site. But that is, people flew here from all around the world yeah. when it, it was actually unveiled, you might say, launched here in San Francisco at the Beat Museum. And it was remarkable how people, scholars, Pilgrims, lovers of Kerouac, Ginsburg, that entire crowd, they flew in from all around the world to get close to it, not just to see it on a screen. And why are we so touched, moved, motivated by this? There's another image in Fellini. I think it's his film Roma, in which it's discovered that the by, by the, the, the hero, again, all these the heroes are based on him, Fellini, Fellini himself, in which it's discovered that during the, the boring, B-O-R-I-N, by the huge uh, tunnel drillers, that they ha have found an underground manor house underneath the streets of Rome that has frescoes. But you better get there quick. So this is just gloriously filmed because I think it captures much of what I'm trying to do in my tours, people like Coleman Barks, a friend of mine, the great Rumi translator, mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Harvey, people that I respect who are trying <coughs> to provide, offer something that's out of the ordinary so that you can have an experience and not just check off something on your itinerary checklist. So in, in this sense, what happens is that the, the Flaney-like character dashes in a with his filmmaking friends to this site where the, now they have to then take an elevator down a few floors and they walk inside and they see this boring, this drill under, underground drilling machine that's creating a new subway. That's how they found it. 
they stop the drilling, they turn off, there's this huge machine, and they walk inside this <coughs> room that has been untouched probably for 2,000 years. And the frescoes, which reveal contemporary Roman life from 2,000 years ago, similar to the ones that have been discovered and preserved at Pompeii, they walk in and they begin to shoot. But after 30 seconds or so, you hear a whoosh, and it's the sound of wind, oxygen coming in through the hole that the subway boring machine has made. And as the wind comes in, the hero based on Fellini and all the filmmakers, they look on in horror as the murals disintegrate before their very eyes. It's one of the great shots in movie history. And the connection for me is that's how fast the past is disappearing. Mm -hmm. The past and also the soul of the past, the things that matter when you say, uh, knock down a, a megalithic site in Ireland to put up a, a subdivision. And people say, can't stop progress, can't stop City Hall. Well, guess what? You can't if yeah. there are enough people who care about these things. And I believe in my heart of hearts that there is a kind of urgency behind intelligent and informed and respectful tours, tourism, mm -hmm. travel like we, are, we have been discussing. And that is, let's go in and let's try to preserve these places so that's, maybe that's one more element we can touch on before we go. <clears throat> and that is I encourage people about halfway through the tours, once I help them, encourage them, you know, intensify their affection for a place, Ireland, France, England, whatever it might be, to get involved with one cause. That's powerful. Choose one. Yeah. Don't get overwhelmed because you're not gonna change the world overnight. But if enough of us can get, get involved in one thing. So for me right now, it's sending some money to Afghanistan because I've become friends with this wonderful man named Lanny Cordova, who has been teaching young Afghani war orphans, young girl orphans from the wars over the past 20 years to play guitar. And he's had guitars donated by Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys which the girls are now playing uh, Beach Boys songs. Learn, this is the way they learn English. This is the way that they learn that people are actually kind around the world. And now, of course, they're in terrible peril because of the, of the Taliban overtaking the country. So this is one small cause that I can help with. But you, you feel the, 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 the sense of it's a kind of urgency. I will make a plea the last day, then the last night, then the last morning. Have you decided on a cause, Some, something to help with here? It could be sending $100 to the uh, Archaeological Society in Istanbul to help preserve some of these sites that they're finding are now eight, 9,000 years old. It may not sound like a lot, but $100 can go a long way in Turkey. So you see, this the the... This helps us arrive at the, the, the last metaphor for our discussion. And that is without, with being, try, no, without being a smart aleck again about it, one difference that I found is that the operative metaphor in tourism is to take. We take a photograph. We take home souvenirs. We take a trip. <laughs> and the locals often sneer at us. They fold their arms. They have a love-hate relationship with us because they think we are on the take. So it's an aggressive metaphor. Yes. We are taking and not touching, to go back to the touching metaphor again. You don't get involved. Often when someone says, I just spent a week in Turkey or the Greek islands. So who did you talk to? I Most tourists have not had a single conversation with a local. Yes. So the pilgrim model, and one way I, de I then decided on this, at the risk of sounding pious, <laughs> and it has worked because most people do understand what I'm trying to talk about, is that the pilgrim gives all the tourist takes. Mm -hmm. You give of yourself. 
You tell a story about where you come from, what you do while you're home, where your family is from. You sometimes give a little bit of assistance. You might help with the cause while you're there. Uh, I'm involved with Vietnam veterans who are sending money back to Vietnam as a form of atonement for the villages that they burned. And if I ever hear about, let's say, friends or family going to Vietnam, let's say on a two-week biking trip, I suggest maybe you could get in touch with uh, Soldier's Heart, I think it's called, this organization that gives money to help war orphans there. In other words, this is a way for us to finally make a move into something we might call wise tourism, wise travel, where we're not just taking taking. Instead, we're giving something back, ideally of ourselves. I love that point. That's a, that's a great point to end on, just this idea that we can travel and leave a place better than we found it. And for that to become a model for all travelers, I think would be really impactful. And I think it could change the world, actually, because there's so much travel going on now on the planet as we kind of open the conversation with. Let's, let's do that. My friend, Jeff Greenwald, a great travel writer. He also has an, an organization dedicated to just these causes. And he does have a checklist in the best sense. Where is your money going? Check to see where the money is going. Is it an inter, <coughs> if you are using a hotel, does the money stay there in Burma or does it go back to Manhattan? When you are going to a restaurant, are you making, do you know if the money is actually going to the servers and the cooks there? These are not big questions to answer. You can ask these. And every time you decide on the, uh, on, to be on the side of local people versus international travel conglomerates, then you're helping us slowly create a revolution in travel. Thanks, Phil. And, and just in closing, I want to ask you, what do you hope for anyone who is thinking about considering or has decided to go on a pilgrimage, whether that be with you or just in general? To make a contribution. There is going to be an initial urge for all of us just to escape from our booby hatches. <laughs> we all feel trapped for the last year and a half, and that's understandable. But I just ask everybody to take a breath take a pause and then choose because we are among the privileged who can travel and we choose our destinations. If we can, let's not just go to entertain ourselves or distract ourselves. A lot of the travel business is built on distraction. Let's just go and distract ourselves. Let's go get wacky or wacky and wild for a week or two. But instead, the world needs us in many ways, in, in informed ways. So where can we go that, where we can make a, a contribution of some kind? And that way, uh, I think we'll have a more meaningful life, period. Beautiful. Well, for anyone tuning in, uh, this has been Phil Cousineau. And we thank you, Phil, for your adventurous, vibrant energy and for expi uh, inspiring us to give back on our pilgrimage pilgrimages and to seek out a sense of adventure and reintegration and personal growth. And thank you. That was a wonderful recap. Thank you. Travel safe, everybody. <laughs>